Good morning. My name is Jared. I'm the teaching pastor here with Bridgepoint. I'm really glad you're here today as we continue this series called Storylines. As we're moving through this series, each week we are looking at one of the most predominant themes that we find in the stories we love. These themes capture our hearts. They represent part of what it means to be human. And today we are looking at the storyline of rags to riches. Uh, So many of the stories we watch or read tell a story of someone going from nothing to something, right? We, we know these stories, and they're so popular, they're so common, that we wanted to give you an opportunity to participate in the message today. And so there is a way for you to use our app or our website to text in or to write in your favorite rags to riches story. So I'm giving you permission. Take out your phone, open the app, go to the website, and write in your favorite rags to riches story. I'm going to read them in just a few moments. These stories tell of someone who, who goes from poverty to riches, for someone who, who starts as a nobody, someone who's forgotten or overlooked, and they become someone important. These stories often tell of someone who's down and out getting back on their feet and finding success or fame or fortune, right? And so a few of my favorites I want to share with you. Um, There's a series on ABC that started last year. It's called Designated Survivor. I don't know if you've seen it. Kiefer Sutherland is the star. And in this show, he he is uh, a part of um, the government, but he has such a low-level position that they choose him to survive. uh, (laughs) Siri, Siri thinks I'm talking to her right now. Sorry. I said series. <laughs> Technology's awesome, right? So, so in this show, this man who really starts as nothing becomes something. He's thrust, after a catastrophic event, he's thrust into the position of presidency of the United States. And he has to figure out how to do it and gain trust and restore America. And so it's this great, great storyline. Another one that I love is a a movie from years ago starring Will Smith and his son called The Pursuit of Happiness. There's this man whose life is just broken, homeless, seems like nothing is going his way, and his son needs him to come through for him. And so he works hard to get on his feet and to be successful and to make something of himself, all in this pursuit of happiness for him and his son. It's an incredible story. Maybe for you, you love cartoons. You love animated movies. And so you can remember the movie Aladdin. It starts with this pauper, this thief, right? Who's really nothing. And people don't respect him. People don't necessarily enjoy him being around. And then he meets the genie, right? And he gets his wishes and he gets the princess. He becomes a prince. He goes from nothing to something really great. We love these stories, right? We love these stories so much that we even love seeing them come alive in real life. Right? I think that that's part of why reality television is so popular today, is it's an opportunity for ordinary people, just like you and me, to have the chance to break it, right? To make it big, to find their break, and to make something of themselves. And so we have all these shows that tell of ordinary people having a chance to win millions or a chance to be a star. And so maybe you have even your favorite real-life rags-to-riches story. I'd like for you to, to see mine, okay? So... Um, There's this show, America's Got Talent. There's a British version of it. And several years ago, there was a lady who no one ever expected to be fantastic, right? Maybe you've seen the clip. Here's the beginning of her Rags to Riches story. Hi, what's your name, darling? My name is Susan Boyle. Okay, uh, Susan, um, where are you from? I am from Blackburn near Bathgate, West Lothian. It's a big town. It's a sort of collection of, it's a collection of uh, villages. I had to think there. And how old are you, Susan? I am 47. And that's just one side of me. (laughs) Okay, what's the dream? I am trying to be a professional singer. And why hasn't it worked out so far, Susan? Well, I've never been given the chance before, but he's hoping it'll change. I dreamed a dream in time gone by. I 
Doesn't that make you feel great? I love that clip because there's nobody, this person you never expect, and within a, like the first few notes out of her mouth, you know that she has a chance to become something great, right? And sure enough, her career unfolds after this. She, her first album, which came out of this show, she won the competition, was the best-selling debut album of all time in the UK. She went on to make tens of millions of dollars. She's still producing and performing. It's an incredible story of someone going from nothing to something. We love these stories. They capture our hearts because I think deep down, we want to believe that there is an opportunity in our world, no matter who you are, no matter what you start as, that there's a chance for you to become something more, something better than you are today, something or someone great, right? We long to know that that is true. In fact, I believe that it's written into the DNA of our country, right? There's this professor up at the University of Vermont who studies story, who studies literature and narrative, and he wrote this about this idea, uh, this, this theme of rags to riches. He says, the rags to riches emotional arc embodies a story that we all love to believe in, wildly popular in the American dream itself. It's a story of hope and fairness where regardless of beginning and bad times with effort, things will get better and eventually result in good fortune. Uh, The author of that quote is Andy Regan from the University of Vermont. That is a part of our country. We want to believe that everyone has the opportunity to go from nothing to something, to make something of themselves, right? And so, we, we love these stories. They connect with our hearts. And, and I'd like to share, I hope that you guys shared a few at least. I'd like to read a few that came from the audience. All right, great. Um, someone says, The Count of Monte Cristo, the 2004 Boston Red Sox. <laughs> I love it. Um, uh, let's see here. What else? A Disney Pixar's Cars 3. Is that Corbin? That might have been my son. <laughs> Uh, Forrest Gump, and there are several others that I could keep reading. It's great. And thank you for your participation. We love these stories. Um, Someone uh, years ago studied uh, the the narrative arc uh, of stories that really capture our hearts, and they noticed this theme in Rags to Riches stories. What they did is they tried to chart, I mean, like create a graph out of the storylines of these different themes. And they realized that there's this, this recurring pattern in Rags to Riches stories. And they, they actually created a graph to represent it, and it looks like this. Check this out. Okay, so they said in these rags to riches stories, it, it almost always looks like this. The character begins building from nothing. And eventually they, they start to make something of themselves. The, the, the graph represents the chronology of the story and then the, the building of the favor or the fortune of the main character. And eventually it appears as if this main character is going to make something of themselves, that their dreams are going to be achieved. But almost always in this story, it, the, the character bottoms out. Things fall. They plummet to, to uh, ill fortune only to eventually be restored to a place where, where they experience the success or good fortune or fame that they had been pursuing. That this is almost always the story of rags to riches. Let me give you an example, okay? One of the greatest and most popular rags to riches story, stories is Cinderella, right? Cinderella starts as nothing. She's hated by her family. She's poor. She's working around the house with no appreciation. But then she meets the fairy godmother, right? And so things start to look a little better for her. The fairy godmother grants her wishes and gives her what she needs, a new wardrobe and glass slippers and a a wonderful carriage for the ball, right? And so she rushes off and it seems like things are going well and people think she's beautiful and delightful for maybe the first time in her life and she meets this man, right? And you can just see the arc of the story moving up. And so she has a great time and then she, she knows that the clock is about to strike midnight, right? And so she runs away, leaving everything behind because It's all come to an end, crashing back down, right? She's back home with her stepsisters and living the life she's always been. And it seems like all hope is lost until the prince goes searching for the foot that fits the slipper, right? And it's only then that the foot fits the slipper that happily ever after is restored, where she finds that her dream is actually coming true and she gets to be who she wanted to be, right? And so you see this arc playing out in this storyline. And you could probably apply this to your favorite rags to riches story, whether it's in real life or in fiction. 
And I share all this because I believe that this gives us a way to understand the story of God that is revealed in Scripture. I believe that actually what we're going to look at today is that the story of God that is told in Scripture is really just three layers of the most beautiful and brilliant rags to riches story that's ever been told. And if we can understand it like that, it will make it come to life for us and it will even help us to understand our place in it. And so we're going to look at the story of God revealed in Scripture in three layers, all woven together with this theme of rags to riches. So we're going to begin where all stories begin in the Bible, and that is in Genesis chapter 1. Now, as a part of this series, we've been going there a lot because as we're looking at these themes and tracing them through what God has done, it's the best place to start, right at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 is the first chapter of the Bible, and what we have at the very beginning is that nothing exists, okay? Check this out. It says, in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, this is the very beginning, first two verses of the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, And now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And so as we are given this glimpse into eternity past before creation, we are told that there was nothing but God, which that alone is an idea that would make our minds spin, right? But there was nothing that we know that already existed except God. The Jesus Storybook Bible that we read to our kids describes it like this. It says, in the beginning there was nothing Nothing to hear, nothing to feel, nothing to see, nothing but emptiness and darkness. There was nothing but nothing but God, right? And so that's where everything began, with nothing. And then we see over the next couple chapters how creation unfolds. And there's wave after wave where God speaks and things come into existence. And I don't really care how you believe God created everything. The important thing from this text is that you believe that God did create everything. And so from this, we see these waves of creation. God creates the lights and he creates the sky and the waters of the earth and the land. And then he starts to create life in this new world. And he creates life in the sky and the sea. And and even today, people are discovering new species of animals in the darks of the ocean, in the depths of the ocean. It's just amazing. God created life all around us. He created animals that would move along the ground and fly in the air. And then the pinnacle of this creation, as we've already said in this series, was God creating mankind in his image. A man and woman created in his image. And then he gave them responsibility that really only rightfully belongs to him. He said, you're going to care for and keep all of this creation. He made us stewards of what he just created. And so in some ways, we have his position in this world. And we reflect his image, his character to the world around it. And it seems like this would be the perfect pinnacle to a story, right? That God has created and we are living in perfect relationship with him in this paradise of sorts. But we know that that's not the end of the story. We know that in in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, the clock is about to strike midnight, right? Because Adam and Eve choose to do the one thing that God told them not to. In this one moment, they choose to go their way rather than his. They eat the fruit and things shatter, right? And so following this this storyline, you see that after it seems like we're at a high point, everything crashes down to the bottom. The relationship that mankind had with God is broken, There is tension between uh, man and woman, people. There's even conflict in in one's own being. And then we know that sickness and disaster and devastation and death creep into the world. And so nothing is as it should be. And so there's there's this deep ravine of brokenness that follows what seemed to be the pinnacle of God's creation. And to be honest, we still live in that valley, right? We still live with this brokenness all around us. And sometimes it hurts, and we wonder how long is it going to last. But we are told, according to to the story of Scripture, that one day it does get better. We're given this glimpse into heaven at the very end that shows us that someday God is going to restore his broken creation to what it was always supposed to be, where mankind gets to live forever with him, with perfect joy and peace and satisfaction. And so while we wait for that, we go, man, it seems like it's taking a long time, right? First Peter, excuse me, second Peter chapter three explains it this way. It says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so when we look and we're like, man, this valley seems like it's lasting an awful long time, it's because God's not working on the same clock we are. 
right? It says that a thousand years is like a day for him, and a day is like a thousand years. That he doesn't, he, he's not restricted or confined to the same sense of time that we are. And so God is working out his plan, even though it may not always feel like it, right? And so we know that someday this rags to riches story will be complete. What started with nothingness will result in mankind being reunited with their creator God because of faith in Jesus. That anyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So the second layer to the rags to riches story of the Bible is the life of Jesus, okay? So the way that God accomplishes this restoration is that he enters into our mess. He comes into the brokenness, right? He takes on flesh in the person of Jesus, and there is no more humble beginning than what Jesus experienced. I mean, the Almighty God, you want to talk about things that make your mind spin. The Almighty God took the form of a helpless infant, like if you've held a baby, you know how helpless they are, right? They can't do anything on their own, and that's how God entered our world. Not only that, but he entered in the most humble of ways. He was born to a family from this small town. They were probably uneducated and illiterate and most likely very, very poor. They were young, and they were in over their heads, and his mother had to wear a scarlet letter for the rest of her life because of what looked like an illegitimate birth. And that is the environment, Jesus, that's the family Jesus was born into. We're told in, in Luke chapter 2 how uh, G, the, the birth of Jesus plays out. That his family went to Jerusalem for the census, but there was no room for them. And so they're pushed out to a barn, and he's born among animals. And if not for some shepherds from the fields that followed an angel to that place, the entire world would have not even known that this event happened, Right? And so for the first 30 years of Jesus' life, we know almost nothing about him. He lived in relative obscurity. He was insignificant to most of the people around him. He had the most humble of beginnings. He really started as nothing. And yet we see around the age of 30 that Jesus starts to reveal who he really is. He travels around. He begins in his hometown of Nazareth. He reads this Old Testament passage of Scripture that describes the Messiah, the Savior God would send. And then as he's standing up in front of some of the people from his hometown, he goes, hey, just so you know, that's me. They weren't really thrilled with that claim. And then Jesus leaves and he starts to reveal to people who he is. He performs miracles. So a few times he sees people who can't walk and and he restores their, their legs. He, he gives sight to the blind. He enables the deaf to hear. He casts out demons. He walks on water. He multiplies food to feed the crowds. He does amazing things that people had never seen before. And so they start to get excited about that. And then Jesus opens his mouth. And people had never heard anyone teach with the wisdom or authority of Jesus. They'd never seen a love like his. They were drawn to him. And so as Jesus started to travel around and reveal himself, people were drawn to him. Crowds flocked. People pushed to get closer to him. They were enamored with him and wanted to be closer. And all of that, you can, again, you can tell that this storyline is building, right? And then it reaches what, what seems like this climax in John chapter 12. It's, it's found in other places too. It's known as the triumphal entry where Jesus is, is traveling around. He starts to go toward Jerusalem where he and his closest friends will celebrate the Passover feast, the biggest Jewish holiday. And so he, with, with hundreds of thousands of people, are flocking into the city of Jerusalem. And as he's coming, again, word has spread and rumors have been building about who Jesus might be. And the crowd hears that he's coming and they surround him. And they start taking off their coats and laying them before him. They start cutting down palm branches so they can wave them in the air and sing songs to him, saying that it's the son of David coming to the city of David to be the king of Israel. They truly believe in that moment that Jesus is the king they've been waiting for. He's the one who will make Israel a world power again. He'll restore peace and prosperity to their land. They totally believe in him in that moment. And if the story stops there, it would seem like this perfect rise to good fortune, right? But we know that that's not where the story ends. Just like in the story of creation, the clock is ticking and the clock is about to strike midnight. And just a few days after Jesus triumphantly enters into the city of Jerusalem, things change. People turn on him. The religious leaders are deeply offended by the things he claimed about himself. Other people start to question him and believe the religious leaders and they get caught up in in the persecution, the opposition to Jesus. And while the triumphal entry happened on Sunday, by Friday, Jesus is hanging on the cross. That Thursday night, he was betrayed by one of his closest friends. He, he was taken to trial. He was arrested. He, he was falsely accused. And then he was sentenced to crucifixion after being beaten 
ruthlessly. He's forced to march up a mountain. He's kneeled to the cross. He's lifted up for all to see his shame. And he breathes his last breath. And for all who had watched him, for all who had followed him, they truly believed that that was the end. They believed that all hope was lost. There has never been a darker day for anyone than the, that Friday night and Saturday for those who had followed Jesus. They were hiding in fear. They thought they were next. They, they were absolutely terrified of what the rest of their life would be because they had placed all their hope, not in a set of beliefs, but in a person. And that person was buried in the ground. And hope does not die. And so they thought it was over. And so again, using this framework to understand the story of the life of Jesus, we see this rise and this dramatic, devastating fall. But again, the story's not over yet. We see that just three days later, there are these women who go to the tomb to remember Jesus and pay their last respects. They, they're going to anoint his body, probably lay some flowers at the grave. But when they get there, they see the stone rolled away. They walk inside and it's empty. And they're greeted by this dazzling angel that says, don't worry, the body hasn't been stolen. Jesus is alive. They struggle to believe it at first. They run back to tell the disciples. Even the disciples didn't believe it. So if you ever struggle to believe the resurrection, don't worry, you're in good company. They needed to see Jesus and have a personal experience with him to believe it. But once they did, their lives were transformed. This trembling group of disciples turned into a, a group of people that would turn the world upside down because of what they believed about the resurrection. They believed that if Jesus truly rose from the grave, then they had hope not only in this life, but in the next, and they would do anything to maintain that. And so again, we see this rise to the riches God intended, that Jesus starts off as almost nothing, right? Ordinary, dependent, unknown to the world, and he ascends to be the king, the one who defeated death. This is, um, this is powerfully summarized in Philippians chapter 2. See if you can pick out, pull out the rags to riches story from this text. Starting in verse 6. It says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. But therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see it? That Jesus rose and then fell, only to rise again to glory. And because of that, we have the opportunity to do the same. By placing our faith in him, we get what he has. We get to experience the eternal life, the victory over sin, life after death. If only we place our faith in him because at the end, anyone who believes in Jesus, for them, the slipper fits. We're welcomed as sons and daughters of God. And so that leads to this last layer of the rags to riches story in scripture, which causes us to ask the question, what's our place in it, right? How do we belong in this story of going from nothing to something? And the answer is that all of us, just like Jesus, when we were born into this world, we're, were born as something small, right? Dependent. We can't do anything for ourselves. We are totally dependent on others. But from that point forward, we all want to make something of ourselves, don't we? I mean, whether you're able to express it or not, like right now, you are trying to make the rags to riches story come true for you. And, so, and, and however you define the richest part, right? It could be your popularity or your reputation. It could be the, peer, the appearance of success or accomplishment. It could be the accumulation of wealth and possessions. But in some way or another, we are all trying to go from being nothing to being something, right? We long for that. We want to have a place of significance, at least for ourselves and, and for our families, if not for others around us. And so we find ourselves in this pursuit of greatness. At the same time, we know that there is something broken about us, that we are born into sin, and you go, oh no, not those sweet little babies, right? 
Well, we average about 20 to 25 uh, little, little ones in the nursery. You could go back and ask that team if all those kids are innocent, and I'm sure that they would help you understand that we are born into sin, right? You don't have to teach kids to be selfish or stubborn or rebellious. Like, they just seem to pick that up, right? Um, this is articulated in Psalm 51, verse 5. Psalm 51, verse 5 says this. This was written by King David. He said, surely I was sinful at birth. I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me. It took one diaper change for me to realize that there's something nasty that lives in my kids, right? <laughs> I just, you just know it. And I know that that is also true of me. As much as we might like to claim it, we do not grow out of that. In fact, sin grows in us, right? And we find new ways to express the same selfishness, the same sinfulness, the same stubbornness that we possess as children, and so while we are aware of that, we are all in this pursuit of trying to become a better version of ourselves. Like, set aside the spiritual aspect for a minute. We are all in, in, in this pursuit of trying to, to get a grip on our words, our thoughts, our feelings, our actions. There are certain things we hope we're not dealing with a week or a year from now, right? Don't you want to be a better version of yourself next year at this time than you are right now? Like, we are all wanting to make something of ourselves, not just in this world, but within us. But it's a battle that we are struggling with because sin lives within us. So maybe your experience has been like mine. It's like playing whack-a-mole, right? Like you feel like you deal with one sin and another one pops up. You get your words under control and all, all of a sudden there are these wicked thoughts that are creeping into your heart. You deal with greed and all of a sudden there's lust. You get control of your self-control and then all of a sudden you're, you're struggling with your words again, right? And it's just like we're, we're just pounding away trying to solve the problem on our own with very little success. And I think ultimately this reveals to us that we, we have this desire in us. And again, many of us may not be able to express it or articulate it, but we have this desire within us to be right with God. Like we don't want to be at odds with God. We don't want to be judged for our sins. We, don't, we certainly don't want them to be held against us. And so we want to believe, whether it's now or at the end of our days, that God will grant us mercy, right? That he will look past the worst parts of us so that we can be right with him and have a chance for heaven, Right? And I think sometimes our religious pursuits are for the sake of giving us hope or confidence that God will be okay with us at the end, right? But at some point, we've got to come to realize that we cannot climb our way to God on our own, that the path to God is not up, but down. So as we are trying to build and make something of ourselves, as we're trying to become great or get self-control or become the best version of ourselves, the reality is that you cannot get to God on that path. There's a different way. John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 say this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Do you hear that? There is no pursuit of self-righteousness. There's no attempt to live by good works that can make you right with God. What makes you right with God is coming to grips with the fact that you can't do it on your own so that you fall before him and you express your need for him and you, you acknowledge your dependence and you allow the grace and the mercy of Jesus to cover you and to make you right, to make you who you want to be. And that may seem like a dramatic fall for someone who has been spending their entire life building themselves up to project dignity and strength and control. But what we find is that falling before the Lord is the first step and the only step we need to take to be brought back to the position that we so desire to be made right with him. Jesus tells this parable in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He's surrounded by what are called people who are confident in their own righteousness. These are religious leaders. They followed all the rules, and so they thought that they were right with God based on their own righteousness, their own behavior. And Jesus needs to help them understand something. He says this in verse 9, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, to understand, Pharisees consider themselves righteous because they spend their entire lives following the commands of God. But the tax collectors were considered some of the worst of the worst when it came to sin. 
So as these two come to the temple to pray, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Do you hear his pride? Look what I do. I'm glad I'm not like him because I'm made right with you based on this. Verse 13 says, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who exalt themselves or humble themselves will be exalted. He says, if you are like the first, thinking that you can be justified, made right with God based on your own obedience, your own conformity to a religious standard, you are lost because you can't get there. But if you are like the second in the story, whose sins are many, but he knows it, and he bows before the holy God begging for mercy, he says, you will be justified before the Lord. You will be declared innocent Because whoever tries to exalt themselves, whoever tries to make themselves great on their own apart from me, they will be humbled someday. But whoever humbles themselves, who takes the nosedive of repentance, I will exalt them. I will give them their heart's desire. And they will be great with me forever. This is the story of the gospel. See, we see these three layers of a rags to riches story converging at the cross Creation is a rags to riches story that is ultimately about the redemption that we will all experience at the end of time. The life of Jesus is a rags to riches story that finds its resolution in the resurrection that claims new life and hope for all who believe in him. And ours is a rags to riches story that requires us to fall face down before the Lord and admit that we can't do it on our own. But when we do, when we declare our need for him, for Jesus, then we receive the prize of heaven today and forever. And so the challenge for us is to respond appropriately. Maybe you've already surrendered your life. You've taken that that plunge and you've declared that you need Jesus. And so your story today is one of celebration, that God has given you what you could never work for on your own. You can never earn or deserve. He's given you hope that cannot be lost because of the resurrection. But if you haven't yet, surrender to Jesus, if you're still trying to be good enough, if you're still trying to earn your way back to God through religious acts or practices, or if you're just hoping that things will balance out in the end, then my, my plea to you is stop relying on yourself. Humble yourself before the Lord. Acknowledge your need for Jesus and let him lift you up. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says this, For you know that the grace, I'm sorry, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus offers us an exchange. He says, I became poor for you. I gave up the treasures of heaven, even if just for a time. I walked through hell and back for you. I gave you my riches, so that if you would just surrender to me, you would live with them forever. What we see here throughout scripture is one story that reveals to us that Jesus took the rags of humanity, our filth, our sin, our mess. Jesus took the rags of humanity so that we, through faith, might inherit the riches of heaven. Let me pray. Almighty God, I thank you that you have written this story and invited us to be a part of it. We believe in it. We know that it's true. And I pray that you would use it now to shape us and save us. For any who have not yet acknowledged their need for Jesus, I pray that you would move in their hearts right now. For all who have, I pray that you give them joy in knowing how the story ends. God, you are so good and merciful and kind to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.